Philippians chapter number 1 and verse number 2. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Let's pray before we go any further. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We praise you for how you answer prayer. We thank you for your marvelous grace. And we thank you for the opportunity you've given us tonight. I pray that you use the truth of the word of God to be a help. Lord, to cause encouragement, assurance, and Lord, to inspire us to do your will. Thank you again for what you've done and what you're going to do. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we started out this introductory letter to the book of, to the church at Philippi, Paul is writing this, we would say, from a jail, from prison. And this is one of four epistles written from uh, a jail cell, you might say. This particular letter he addresses to the believers at Philippi. And in the beginning of this passage, it is a salutation, a greeting. And in verse number two, he mentions, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. He's writing this letter in partnership with Timothy or Timotheus, as he stated here, but it's addressed to the believers in the church at Philippi with the bishop status, with the pastors and the deacons in that ministry. And I love the fact that Paul uses the word grace be unto you and peace from God our Father. It's kind of like a, a greeting, a blessing when you address someone in a letter or email, you ask, how are you? I trust things are going well. In this case, he uses the word, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father. In verse number three, the Apostle Paul expresses thanks for the believers in this church. He tells us, I thank God upon every remembrance of you. His memories of the Christians here are something dear to his heart. He loved them and they loved him. As a matter of fact, they were the believers that partnered with him in ministry with their worldly goods and in one situation sent Epaphroditus to deliver those material goods. More than any other church, the believers in Philippi offered Paul material support for his ministry according to 2 Corinthians 8, 11, and Philippians chapter 4, which we'll get to verses 15 through 18. And uh, would to God that all churches would operate, including us. Uh, I appreciated this, this ministry, uh, how we have been able to support those that God has led us to help in the missionary cause, and to be able to do the extra, and to be able to go the extra mile. That's what Paul is indicating about this church here. And then as we go further into the text in verse 4, we discover that Paul was a praying man. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy. Does this sound like your prayer life? Does this sound like my prayer life? He interceded them for the believers at the church of Philippi with joy. Those believers there encouraged him in many ways. And I couldn't think of a better thing for do for someone out there than to pray for them. Don't take it lightly when someone tells you, I'm praying for you. Amen. We could all use that intercession. And now we come to verse number five, which is very unique. Verse five says, for, the, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. I think we understand the idea of fellowship. It is coming together. Most Christian fellowship is about talking, hopefully talking about the Lord, 
uh, maybe sharing our burden one with another in prayer. That's kind of what we do on Wednesday nights where we take the time to hear testimonies and share our burdens. And, and maybe it could be a little bit more and uh, coming alongside and, and maybe even going uh, together to visit someone. And uh, in their case, fellowship in the gospel meant taking the truth of the word of God, somehow partnering together for the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that the Apostle Paul was in this area of Macedonia for about three months, so he partnered with them. They might, as we would say, co-labor. And this fellowship of the gospel was more than a shaking of hands, having a cup of coffee together. It was not just sharing a pew where to sit in a church service. This was about taking the gospel in the pathway as God commanded to those around them. Being in harmony with the Great Commission of reaching the lost. According to Jesus in Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, Jesus said this, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, all ethnicities, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Think about this. Paul had the wonderful privilege of being used of God to see this congregation, to see this church started at Philippi, and it began with a businesswoman that we made reference to last week named Lydia, and then along with the jailer and his family, and all of them, we would say, trusted in Jesus. We're born again, we're saved. All of them were baptized. And they grew spiritually in the Lord. And so they shared a commonality of faith in Christ. And they heard Paul preach. And they co-labored together in proclaiming the wonderful gospel. Would to God that believers, Christians, would do the same in every ministry. It was Paul Harvey, the old radio, radio commentator, who said, We've drifted away from being fishers of men to keepers of the aquarium there is something worth our time and effort and we would say that is taking the life-changing gospel into all the world now we come to verse number six in our passage and this is the goody of the text that i want to emphasize for just a little bit being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. What does this mean? What is Paul referring to? What God started in the believers in the church of Philippi, we would say, was a work of grace. That is, the believers came to faith in Jesus by the grace of God. And if you're a believer, you come to faith in Christ through the unmerited favor of God, through grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so the good work that started in the believers is that one of salvation. When someone gets saved, when someone gets born again, it is a good work of God. It, is com it comes into the life of a believer when they recognize their need of a Savior, and they truly have repented and place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the starting point. This is the beginning of a good work in an individual's life. And so in the process of growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Word of God, we would call this sanctification. And one day to meet in the presence of God, we would call that glorification. And so from the beginning when God saved you, when you came to that realization that you needed a Savior, notice the text says, being confident, that is, he has assurance. He which hath begun a good work in you. What, what does that mean? It's talking about salvation. It's talking about when you saw your need for being saved, when you trusted in Jesus. Lydia saw her need for being saved. She trusted in Jesus. The Philippian jailer, if I may recall, in chapter 16 of the book of Acts, there was an earthquake 
And because the jailer there saw the earthquake and thought the prisons, prisoners had escaped, he would have taken his own life, committed suicide. But Paul and Silas were in that prison that night, not for doing something wrong, but for simply living for Christ. And that's another sermon in the cell. But what were they doing? They were singing and praising God. And the Philippian jailer who was about to take his life when Paul said, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And the Philippian jailer said, what must I do to be saved? And I love the statement in its simplicity. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. That's when the good work starts. When someone places their faith in Jesus Christ and they trust him as Lord and Savior. And then now the rest is ongoing work of grace. Having this confidence, Albert Barnes said, being confident, this is strong language. It means to be fully and firmly persuaded and convinced. Paul had the persuasion that what God started in the believers there in the church of Philippi, he would complete it. He would finish it. He would accomplish it. And you think about this. God didn't save you so that you could try to survive on your own. When he saved you, he gave you eternal life. When you place your faith and trust in Jesus, your sins were washed away. And now today we are recipients of the wonderful grace of God. I like what uh, one man said. He said, though we have all so much to be thankful for, referring to this salvation, this good work in us, the pace and the pressure of life often can squeeze the joy we may possess. Our shoulders slump and our heads are bowed. We find some days or months very difficult to get through. Desperate, we often search for joy in all kinds of ways. Maybe getting things, possessions, visiting places or visiting family or friends. And none of the things are wrong of themselves. But they cannot provide the lasting joy. Where can we find joy? And the book of Philippians, as we mentioned in our introduction and remarks, is about how Paul found joy and how he repeats this truth of joy. Where can we find joy in the midst of trying circumstances? Even like Paul, who was in prison, Paul knew as the Philippians that the true joy comes only through humble faith in the saving work of Jesus Christ and joining ourselves in harmony with his followers and serving others in the name of Jesus Christ. Does that make any sense to you tonight? That our joy is not bound by circumstances, but we have a purpose. We have a motivation to be able to take the truth that has saved our own lives, that has caused us to become a child of God. And God continues to do a work of growth in our hearts and in our minds. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. What God starts in you, God is going to complete. What God began in your life, God is going to finish. And through this life here on earth, we can say amen to what Paul said and we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Not all things are good. Not all things are going to be good that happen in your life, but all things can work together for the good to bring us in the likeness, to bring us in more like the Savior who saved us from our wretched sin, from our wretched self. So child of God, let me tell you, God has a plan, and this plan is great. It begins with a good work, and this good work will be completed. It will be finished when it's time for you to be in the presence of God, for we are truly saved by the wonderful grace of our sovereign Lord. And so with that, I just want to tell you that what God wants to continue to do, His work, His work of grace, what I'm inspired by this believers, and I'm going to leave this one more thought. You know, when the Lord saves us, you know, we, um, we can be connected to a church. 
We can have fellow believers know us and know what's going on, but the true spiritual growth happens when nobody is truly watching over us. And this is what happens in the Christian life when true spiritual growth takes off. What God starts and and God continues to do. Paul said this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, there's been many that have misinterpreted that particular passage. And they will say, doesn't that mean then that I got to do something to earn my salvation, that I got to work it out? No, God is reminding us through this letter that God has imparted to you, that God started a good work in you. Now you have to take which that has been given to you and use it to your own ability, such as the Holy Spirit. Are we yielding to God, such as the word of God? Are we living by the truth of the word of God? And as we walk in harmony, then it will be the work of God to bring Christ likeness in us. And then one day, when our time is over on this earth, we'll be taken from this life into the presence of the eternal God and our Savior and all the saints of the ages. And we'll dwell forevermore in that presence. The best is yet to come, as one man stated. And so we can have confidence like Paul. When someone gets born again, when someone gets saved, there is a work of God going on not only at that moment, but throughout their whole Christian experience. And even to the point when they get into heaven, it is a work of God. It is a work of redemption. It is a work of redeeming and a glorious, glorious returning to the creator God that made you and made me. So God will, God will accomplish what he started in us. If you are born again, if you are saved, God did not start something in you to work only halfway, to work an unfinished product. You being that uh, project or that construction project under construction. God is going to work his work of grace in you and me until we meet him in glory. And that should remind us that God is presently working even now in every situation and every circumstance. The question is, sometimes if you're like me, God, what are you trying to teach me? Is it a little bit more about patience? Is it a little bit more about endurance? Or is it a little bit more about forgiveness? Or is it a little bit more of compassion? Or maybe you need me to have better priorities. Or maybe you need to be more generous, dear God. Maybe you need me to love others more. God is always at work in our hearts and in our minds to bring us to a fuller completion of what Christ, the word Christian means Christ-like, to bring us to more Christ-likeness so that others can see the Savior in our lives. Does that make any sense tonight? Being confident of this very thing. He which hath begun a good work in you will accomplish it, will finish it, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that one day we'll see your face One day we will see you in your presence. Until that time, we thank you that you are working in all of our lives to bring about whatever you so desire. And we would pray you continue to help us to trust in you, to continue to obey you, and you to your perfect plan. And Lord, we'll thank you for that. We pray for anyone that may be listening who has yet to receive a Savior, that they would even tonight trust you, and Lord, we'll give you thanks, and we'll give you praise. We ask these things in your precious name. Amen.